back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel, and I am sad to say we're talking about Coronaville today. The topic we have defined is the national COVID crisis and madness, and it's getting worse. Uh, what a day. Everything going on. I hardly had notes, you guys, um, to tell you all the things we, we should discuss. Cynthia Sinclair, Winston Welch, Stephanie Dalton, Tim Apicella. Let's go for it. Let me be very brief. Yesterday, amazing 3,100 deaths, more than 9-11. Um, and, and it's still going up. And there are still people in this country that deny it and don't want to do masks, including in the state of Idaho. Unbelievable. In boys, where they are, where they are um, you know, threatening members of a, a mask commission to stop any regulation on masks. Uh, we're talking about madness here, and it's, it seems to be spreading like a virus. Uh, so I guess my question is, uh, Winston, how do you feel about all this? Because I'm getting downright depressed. Depressed about Corona and the state of our nation? Well, it's, it would be hard not to. Um, but you know what? There's a lot of good people doing good things. And however, we're facing, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of it feels like a thimble bailing out the, the, the lifeboat. But uh, we have to keep our eyes a little bit set higher on the horizon because if we look at the daily stuff, this death toll, um, I, I did the news about the CDC, uh, Director Redfield uh, apparently uh, telling his staff to delete emails um, that had a political tone that's the, from the White House saying we got to change the message on, on COVID here. Uh, there's a lot out there that is depressing that can consume you, but there's a lot of... Um, I don't want to say hope on the horizon, but it is hope on the horizon. There, right, are, there are vaccines coming. It's why, coming. Did I, why did I know you'd be off, you know, in a relatively optimistic mode? I don't, and I'm not, I'm not that optimistic right now because we're in the thick of it. And if you go outside right now, especially if you're in the mainland, you're just playing kind of Russian roulette out there. And the, the fact that there's so many people that are still denying this, that still think it's some sort of plot or, or whatever, that aren't wearing their masks, this is astounding. To me. I think, I think you know, Tim, I think that what bothers me so much is that he has still, he's still got control. He's got control of the people in Idaho. He's got the Republicans in the, in the Congress. He's got the whole country under control. Whatever mechanism it is, whatever social psychology, strange human flaw in the, in the species, he's got control. And what I worry about, and I like your opinion on, does he have control over the Supreme Court? As I was telling you, you know, you never be sure what a court in this country will do. What strange variables will enter into a decision, even in a cockamamie case like the one that is before it now? What do you think? A lot of questions there, Jay. Good morning. Um, no, he does not have control over the Supreme Court. And if he did have control, it would have been very evident in the nine to zero decision of uh, the Supreme Court challenge in Pennsylvania. They didn't even take the time to write an opinion. They just wrote a 10 word sentence saying, and the last word was denied. Uh, this this, this um, proposal in Texas is even more cockamamie. So I'm not worried about his, um, your question about whether or not he has control over the Supreme Court because three of his appointees also joined in in that decision and it was a nine to zero decision. Uh, we're in the dark ages here, as far as I'm concerned for this country. And there's only one person to blame, and that's Donald Trump, because he set the tone. He lied and he denied. And um, his loyal brainwashed followers are denying to this day that there is a real disease killing off people. As you said in previous shows, people are dying. They're on ventilators or just coming off ventilators, about ready to go on a ventilator, denying that they have COVID and denying that it's COVID is the reason why they're going to be placed on a ventilator. This is madness. You're right. This is madness. Well, um, what about you know what about the, the state of the COVID here, uh, Stephanie? You, you know, if you look at the map, you see that the red states are all red. They're all red. You know, rife with COVID. Um, it's the uh, the the chart is logarithmic, um, and uh, it has every indication of going further logarithmic. As as Tim says, it's really scary to go outside. Uh, and, and rational people are going to just stay inside. Um, but aren't you comforted by the vaccine? 
Uh, yes, uh, but but we've got, uh, you know, the parking garage now is a hospital in some places, and we're still 90% full in the hospitals across the nation, or I think the number was one out of three hospitals are at least 90% full and without much to go. And um, yeah, so we're not going to get that vaccine like I thought I was going to make my plane reservation to get out of here um, next month or February. No, no, because he turned down the hundred thousand, the, the much bigger order opportunity. Make that hundred million, hundred million. Why did that get turned down? Why isn't there more discussion of that? And why can't, and we're too late now. Everybody up else is all, um, you know, uh, lined up and they you can- know, but, but wait a minute, you know, remember Alex, Alex Tazar, the, he's the uh, human services guy, health and human yeah. services. He said, no problem, no problem. We'll have this all done, you know, in a few months, we'll, we'll be able to inoculate everybody. How come well, now, what he says is different um, than what you're saying? Well, you know, but that's lying for Trump because they're all doing whatever he wants. So I'm just like, um, so to the, the, the preacher who's not, still got people coming in by the hundreds, no masks and saying, no, um, I don't believe in, there is no COVID-19 and the idiot interviewer, I don't know who it was, but she never could a ask him, well, then what is it these people have who are in all our hospitals and are not gonna take you in for your heart attack? So the other, the other point I wanted to make is, um, Jay, you're so right about the power that he still has. And the articles I've been reading that have to do with what we need to do first as soon as we get into the new administration is one thing that has to happen is we must contract the time between election and taking over. We're the only country that has this enormous gap of a lame duck. I mean, others have three days or something like that. And we've, that's one of the things we've just got to make a, make a change for, because this is really taking us down the wormhole. And that's a very well, good point, well. Stephanie. You know, it's like, it's like um, you know, we need a constitutional convention once in a while we because do. our constitution, we worship our constitution, but it's really ancient and it, it hasn't been amended on critical points like that. We're not keeping up. We haven't been keeping up. Uh, so, Cynthia, you know, like um, we look to Congress for help. We look to Congress for relief from COVID. We look to Congress for money, for PPE and for unemployment. Um, but we're not getting, how shall I say this? We're not getting anything. I mean, zero. Um, I, you know, what is going on there? Well, I watched um, a number of senators and uh, representatives stand at the podium today and go on and on and on. Willie Gohmert was there for a whole hour even. Um, and all they want to talk about is the election. No mention of what's happening with COVID. No mention. They got all the time in the world to make time to go out there and make these big speeches about how Trump is being robbed, yet they don't have five minutes to meet and get some good solid relief out to the American people. To me, that is criminal. You say they don't have five minutes, but is, is it a question of time? Or is it a question of um, you know, loyalty to, the, to our fearless leader? It's a question of loyalty. And that's sort of my point was, I didn't make it clear enough, I guess. It seems like they've got all kinds of time to support him and no time to support the American people. And I guess well, that's what I was trying to say. Now, one of the things that came up, Cynthia, was uh, I guess it was in the defense spending bill. He said he was going to veto it. It may be veto proof, depending on you know, how much pressure there is on Congress, um, unless they, um, unless they um, pulled out the provision um, or rather included a provision providing uh, pr protection for employers against suits by employees, the, the liability provision there. Mm -hmm. He's insisting on that and so is Mitch McConnell. What are your thoughts on the pros and cons and, and the politics of that provision? Well, you can just look back to the meat packing plants that he forced to go back to work um, when they were not prepared to do it safely. He did not care about that. So he doesn't want anything to come back on those companies or any of the other companies that are Republican run that forced their workers to go back to work. 
And, and I think that's just wrong because we should be putting our health first, not our pocketbooks. And so that just really bothers me a lot. You know, you know what it occurs to me just to, uh, hearing your thoughts about that is that if, if, if I sue a given meatpacking company, the defense of that meatpacking company is, well, they, they had a pass from the administration. The administration was either talking to them publicly or privately and saying it's okay. It's more important that you bring your people back and have them continue working on the, on the production line. And that means, okay, that the administration is subject to political attack, political vulnerability. So I think what McConnell and Trump are doing is more than just a theoretical thing about um, protecting employers, their constituents, big companies from liability to employees. It's protecting Trump and McConnell and Congress and the Republicans from getting blamed in every single suit because that's what the employer is gonna do, right? Right, absolutely, because they can. Because if the employee sues the employer, the employer can turn around directly and go to the Trump administration and say, well, they made us go back. So of course they're protecting themselves, as per always. Right, and I, you know, every single suit uh, would be uh, met with that. Right. Um, so, you know, I, you know, Winston, it's about fear. A lot of reporters that we read uh, talk about fear. I mean, it goes back to Anne uh, Applebaum uh, in the Atlantic um, 90 days ago with um, her comparison of this in Eastern Europe in the 40s. And there are various reasons why people are complicit with what Trump is doing. But, you know, what do you think is operating to make the country so skewed now um, even at a time when he's going to be probably out of office. Why are people still faithful to him? I do not know. I cannot understand it. And I think we're going to be spending the rest of our lives and beyond in trying to understand this effect and the hypnotism that Donald Trump has had. But I think it's, it may be helpful to try and Google why I love Donald Trump or why Trump has my support or something along those or the best things Donald Trump has done for this nation or something along those lines. So you can try and at least delve into the mindset there, ignoring all of the other reality to, to try and understand how he has the support. And when we talked about the red or the, the blue states, there are no red or blue states. We're all purple. Even here in Hawaii, it was 30 percent supported Donald Trump in this last election. So we're shades of, of this. But um, maybe it is it. it, it it's a loss of a way of life. It's nostalgia. It's whatever it is. I don't know what it is because I can't wrap my head around it. Even when I'm presented with, okay, this is what he's done. It just doesn't, it, it's not logical. It's maybe there's some strange um, uh, emotional appeal that goes right to the very back of your, your reptilian brain. Um, I, I could understand that, but our nation is not better than it was four years ago by any stretch of the imagination. What's well, real here's though, a hard question for you, Winston. Well, what, uh, what's real, though, I just want to point out to viewers is that what I find a little bit shocking, we, you know, we, and I do have, I have said, let's follow the CDC, let's follow Dr. Fauci, let's follow Dex, Deborah Birx and our state health folks. They're all kind of overwhelmed with this. The CDC, for the first time this week, just said, wear a mask indoors. This is insane after a year of this pandemic. But D Dr. Burke, she's, she's breaking with this. She said, this is not just the worst public health event. This is the worst event this country will face, not just from a public health side on Meet the Press this last Sunday. Um, you know, so there are, there are people here that are saying reality as it stands. They're just being crowded out from everything else. I do, I saw it really good that I'm forwarding to people that still believe in Donald Trump and everybody else. Uh, an article in The Atlantic, what uh, New York doctors know how bad the pandemic can get. And the, it's the title is Headlines Don't Capture the Horror We Saw, because this is not a real, it, it's not real for people somehow. Uh, they need to personalize this. Washington Post had what seven ICU nurses want you to know about the battle against COVID-19. Very personal stories from these folks on the front lines that make this real, that can help us understand Whatever the noise and drama is surrounding Donald Trump, we are facing a mass pandemic where 
3,000 people a day are dying, and soon it's going to be five. And we're looking at a half a million people dying from this thing. And still you have people denying that it exists or that it's spread by anything. We got to go back to what I've said a lot is this personal responsibility. Don't go out, wear your mask, wash your hands. If you have to go out, exercise extreme care, deny all people. Any I'm having audience. a tattoo made from my left arm. I want to write those. No tattoos. Down. That's personal <laughs> service. You're risking yourself and the tattoo artist. Sorry, tattoo artist. We got to get them. So Tim, I got to ask you this, Tim. But you know, when, when is the bubble going to break? This is also a hard question. When is the bubble going to break on this? I mean, is, do we see um, you know, a, a, a change among the Republicans, among the, the, the conservatives in the country? Are they, are they getting wise to it? Or are they just continuing and doubling down and up under the hypnotic spell no matter what? Now, some people say that when um, you know, the electoral votes are counted, which is um, next Monday, uh, that ought to be a new, kind. If, if it works the way they say, it ought to be a new national holiday, I think. Um, if they're, when they're counted and, and Biden is shown to be the hands down winner, then Trump's bubble will burst. You agree with that? Not entirely. I, I do agree with your theory that you've mentioned in weeks past on uh, my show, that once he is uh, away from the bully pulpit, uh, a lot of his followers will peel off. And a lot of the intimidation goes with it. The intimidation to all the Republican senators that are mortally fearful that he's going to say something bad about them so that their constituents and their districts are gonna think badly of them and they'll be primaried out. Um, I think that goes away. And once that intimidation factor goes away, uh, senators will then discover their little backbone uh, so they don't look like they've been you know, scared little sheep and they'll start speaking out. I think that happens after January 20th. Uh, and I think it'll be slow in coming. Thank God we have five or six uh, GOP senators that have already done that. They've taken that first step. And my hat's off to them. And I just wish it was a little bit earlier. And I think my hat really goes off to Mitt Romney because he had the fortitude and the guts to um, also vote uh, during the... Um, the um, Impeachment. The yeah. Impeachment. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. And, and we and almost no one forgot else had about that. that, didn't we? No one else had that. And, you know, <laughs> he did well. He did well for the nation. Yeah, but what about these Republican governors? We were talking about it earlier, um, you know, 17 of them, and uh, sort of taking it by the horns, them all by themselves, regardless of how people voted and trying to turn over the whole national election uh, in this cockamamie case we talked about. I mean, what, what kind of crazy loyalty is that? And is, is that going to stop? Is that going to keep, is the Republican Party and these governors continue, are they going to continue to be infected with alternative truth? Well, what scares, I don't think they're governors or the attorney generals of those states. And what scares me about that is they are the top cop uh, for their state. And they are the, you know, the protectors of laws. And then they're the ones that, you know, make sure that justice prevails. So that scares me. But what doesn't scare me is that those are amicus briefs. And, you know, I, Jay, you know as well as I do, is an amicus brief is, is, is a statement. It's a symbol. It's not really a, an earnest um, law challenge. Yeah, it's not skin in the game. You're right. Right. Well, hold, hold on to that thought. Okay, Stephanie, so you like parties? They had a party with several hundred people in the White House yesterday. They called it a Hanukkah party. I disavow all connection to that. Um, and and uh, they all came uh, on, on Trump's uh, explicit or implicit um, advice not to wear masks, and they hung around kissing each other. Um, what kind of insanity is that? It keeps on happening. And by the way, you should also mention in your answer that your friend, I say he's your friend because I know he's not my friend, Rudy Giuliani, okay, had, had that uh, Regeneron uh, therapy and was out of the hospital in like two days. Unbelievable, I just know. like Trump. Can, I, can you reserve some of that Regeneron for me too? We better start buying it now, you know, um, but hopefully the vaccine will, will keep us away from it. But I mean, I wanna get real, I wanna go mafia, and I wanna talk social science. This guy is the reinforcer, and he is in position to reinforce out of 
the donations he's getting from people and he's able to give positive reinforcement to those that are uh, big positive reinforcement. Dr. Burke's getting up there and saying those things on Sunday TV. Oh, yo ho ho hum, okay? But he's the reinforcer because he's got positive reinforcement, all that money coming in, all of the power pieces that he can give people and they believe it'll go beyond the election, beyond the inauguration. Obviously they believe that. Okay, because that's what's holding them firm. But even more importantly, he has the negative reinforcers, okay, called punishment. So he's, and he has no problem distributing any of that. And that is what's keeping people in line. And that is not anything, all of this other stuff is beside the point. He's in control and he's the reinforcer and he has the goods to do it at this point. So he needs to not have those goods anymore and get out of um, the power and hopefully out of the money because he's going to be sued, et cetera. But people are terrified because I can imagine, remember, we've talked about this before. All you need is a call from somebody about your kid might be having an accident. You know? Oh, or yeah. We, somebody, we I mean, should explore on. what happened more we about what happened this. in Idaho. Yes. Because that, you know, I don't know if you guys saw the footage of the Zoom show. Uh, where all these commissioners on a mask, uh, mask regulation commission were in a meeting and yep. one after the other, they were getting text messages yep. that their home, their home was embattled, Cynthia. Um, and I just wonder what that, what that shows us, what that tells us, I mean, about, about the way our American democracy is. And, they, and the meeting broke up because they all went home to take care of their spouses and children. Um, it's just and fantastic that people would not only mm, dis disagree about COVID and disagree about masks and, and like Winston's tattoo and all that. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it was my tattoo. Um, thank you. <laughs> but, but they would actually, actually parade outside your house and threaten public officials. So what, is, what does that tell us? You know, I guess my question, Cynthia, is this gonna happen again? Because it, it shows it shows such hubris that it may very well happen again. I think it will absolutely happen again. I think it's going to be ramped up after the 14th. Once we provided that the electors follow the popular vote anyway, then it's going to happen. And even if they don't, it may happen that the Democrats decide to go crazy too. Hopefully not. But what else are we supposed to do, right? What happened with that woman when I heard her, the, the fear in her voice when she said, my 12-year-old is home alone and they are pounding and on the door and pounding at my house, banging on the door. While the meeting's going on, if these people know that they are there to protest against a meeting that is going on. Why aren't they at the meeting? Why are they at the people's homes when they know the people are at the meeting? You know, it was to just break up the meeting, I, I, you know, it, which worked. But so there was never a vote that was taken. This is just about masks. You can imagine if these people are going to get this outrageous and threatening is the word. These aren't protests. These are threatening, um, I, I don't even know what to call them, but they are all full of threats with gun-toting people. So this isn't just a bunch of people sitting around singing Kumbaya, we want peace. This, that's not what's happening. These are angry, violent people that are threatening homes. They're threatening secretaries of state. They're threatening, and now they're- How about governors? Governors, yes, it's it's very scary to me that this kind of stuff is being labeled protest so that it's allowed to continue. Because I think it's a very big mistake and it's a misnomer that they're calling it a protest. Yeah, Winston, you know, did you see Trump's t tweet this morning? I did it was not. A it was a one word tweet. I don't know if anybody caught it fairly recently. And it was something like, um, and I don't remember the exact word, but the, the connotation was turn the election over. 
Yeah. Turn everything over. Oh yeah. Um, late or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, I mean, I think it's getting worse in the sense that he's getting wilder, and people are following him, and the kinds of statements he he is making, um, th those statements speak of completely um, turning the government over. It's a revolution in place. It's a revolution by, by a sitting president. Um, what can we do about this? I mean, I know that we here, we do our job, we talk about it. But what, what can the country do when he's sending out tweets and people in Idaho and was it Michigan um, are responding to those dog whistles with near violence and maybe soon real violence? Um, what can we do when he sends out a tweet that says, turn the government over. Well, we still are ostensibly a nation of laws. We still are a democracy. We still have very uh, robust structures in place. Mm. Granted, our system has taken a beating these last four years uh, on, on so many levels. And this, is, this will be Donald Trump's legacy is he's delegitimized the process of, of, uh, of a proper grievance. Uh, he just says, if it's not my way, it's the highway rather than uh, what we've been used to for the last, you know, 50, 100, 200 years of going and having a reasoned discourse. What can we do? What we can do is we can educate ourselves, educate others. We have to remember also where this is happening. Now, it's going to be scattered everywhere. There's sort of been, a, um, I guess, a mass uh, sociopathism released in our society where it says, do anything, say anything. But this organized sort of thing where they're going to people's houses like this, uh, that needs a, a, a law enforcement response. And hopefully the law enforcement isn't part of the problem. And I don't think that it is. But you have to remember the Anne Frank Memorial in Boise was defaced with swastika stickers that said, we are everywhere. This was this week. We got swastika um, here in Honolulu, Winston. In Honolulu, we're we're okay. You know, I, I, I was walking around my neighborhood the other day. I saw three campaign stickers, still one for Trump, uh, Trump for Hawaii, Hawaii for Trump one for biden harris and then one other one was black lives matter that was three out of the entire you know when i was walking for an hour so we're hopefully here in hawaii we're more sane because we realize we've all got to get along there's nowhere else for us to go hawaii is a different case now if you're living in what, idaho what can we do what can we do you know what we got to hold we just have to hold a, a a consciousness that we're going to get through this as things develop or if they develop they need to be met appropriately by our system and i think our system is in place it's going now we have donald trump who is completely unhinged and he might call out his troops any day now but the mass majority of people even if they believe the election is stolen they're not going to follow the arizona uh gop's call are you ready to die for this man I think they're just be like, you know, not really. I'd rather just go shopping um, or I'd, I'll, I'll wait till after I get my vaccine. And then That's, think that was it. one of the tweets. Yeah. Are you ready to was, die for this man? It was um, one of the tweets. And the answer is yes, because COVID yeah. is running wild <laughs> and there is no. Uh, so the, the well, answer let, is let, me, let me go to Tim on, on the COVID issue there. Mm -hmm. You know, Tim, one of, one of the things that we, we absolutely need to have is uh, enough people vaccinated um, so that we have, uh, you know, community immunity. Um, but, but the number of people who say they um, don't want a vaccination in this country is overall something like 40%. It's higher for men. It's certainly way higher for Republicans. But something over 40% of the people in this country across the board don't want to be vaccinated. It's better than it was a couple months ago, but it's still over 40%. Um, and this real question as to whether even if we have all the vaccine we want, which not at all clear, not clear at all to me, um, uh, that, that we, won't, we won't have enough people taking it to really stop the infection. What are your thoughts about that? Stopping the infection is going to be around for a while. I mean, it's not going to be stopped because of the exact same thing you're bringing up. But those who do get vaccinated, they'll be protected. They can start leaving a normal life again. And I think once that starts happening, the anti-vaxxers, you know, the ones that believe what Donald Trump tells them what to believe, 
they'll start peeling off and they'll start doing it too because they want their life to get normal. But the problem, the problem is that between the time you start vaccinating and the time you vaccinate to say the 60%, um, a lot of that 60% is going to get sick because the other ones aren't doing it. You know what I mean? So what you have is a, is a slow roll here and the possibility of large numbers of infection continuing. True. I think you're right. Um, I, that's why I think COVID will be around the world for years to come. It's, it's not a pandemic, it's an endemic. And I think it's going to be part of our, 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 our daily life uh, for years and years to come. And again, I, I, I think that I think people are going to peel off. They may say they don't want to take the vaccine. They're going to take the vaccine sooner or later. And if it's not by their own, um, their own judgment, then uh, Jay, it'll probably be say, uh, someone from an employment site that's their employer and saying, I'm sorry, if you want to come work for me, you're going to have to take the there vaccine. There you go. That's, or, or, that or, will or, change or, or if the school say, if you want to bring your kids in, I'm sorry, you're going to have to show proof of vaccine. It'll right. come down to social pressure rather than someone's individual perception of freedom and what freedom means to them. Right. And, and as uh, Trump fades into the, you know, the past, uh, he's not going to have control over those people. They're going to be more affected by the school that says your kid can't come without a shot record card. Uh, so I want to go a little technology with you, Stephanie, in the remaining moments. You know, one very interesting story that came up in the, in the news yesterday was about Boston. And uh, Boston has a way of determining community spread before it happens. How do they do that with, this is a Rachel Maddow story. Yeah. Uh, how do they do that with wastewater? Uh, yeah. They check the wastewater for uh, the virus. Um, so what we have is emerging technologies that will help in a community way that we had not anticipated. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Is that gonna well, work? Are we, yeah, gonna, well, are we gonna have other things like that? Well, why isn't it already in place? Because some <laughs> Very colleges good. have already done this, okay? And the other thing, um, so some colleges have test their dorms and as soon as they see it, they, t they deal with the dorm. Another thing, Honolulu dealt with this, and I heard from the medical people out here, because when they closed the beaches, that was where uh, people were starting. I mean, they closed the restrooms or turned off the water or something. Then uh, all these people are going to the beaches to take care of business. And then it turns out that, that the excrement or whatever is, is more efficient in carrying COVID than is saliva or coffee. And so um, people, that's why one of the reasons they closed all the beaches because they were going to the beaches and polluting the beaches and you could walk through there and be in trouble. So anyway, my point is that why isn't this already in place? Because it is, it, it is also working at other places other than Boston. And I was a little shocked that, you know, it's been so late coming up and that Rachel was talking about this as if it's only one instance. So I think all of us ought to have a tap on wherever we are <laughs> and whatever bodies we're using, we need yeah. to do something about it. Cause we could take care of business that way. And also I just want to say, we can start listing Okay, hantavirus, Ebola, the plague, okay, the smallpox, polio. I mean, they're gone. They are, are gone. This will be gone too once America can get its act together, okay? Ebola was gone in three months, and that was a Biden and, of course, an Obama thing. So we, it's going away. Okay, it's going away, but you know, the recognition here, the un, un, uh, underlying recognition is that viruses are with us forever it's part sure. of the planet we and if it isn't if it isn't this one it'll be something else you know uh, cynthia i have so many questions left but we have a viewer question and a viewer question you know takes priority and you are the lucky recipient of this viewer question which is not an easy question either are you ready i'm ready okay do you honestly believe you are perfect for this question. Do you honestly believe that our vote was counted correctly, even with all of the evidence that has been presented? If there is a question of voting fraud, don't you believe it has to be looked into? And we don't know whether the person asking this question is talking about fraud by the Republicans or fraud by the Democrats. So you can, you can answer it any way you wish. <clears throat> In a perfect world, I would say we're going to redo the election. Point blank, hand counted, I mean, hand marked paper ballots, hand counted. Period. And it is the only way 
to really solve this issue. Is that realistic? No, not even at all. I have sat down and I read the entire uh, thing that Texas, that Ken Paxton put out, right? The entire case that he's put together. There are so many fraudulent claims in this case that I read that it just absolutely blows me away. And two of the like major points that made me go, this thing is a joke, was when uh, number 10 and 11, some mathematician comes out and says, well, there's just no um, factual way that the percentages could have gone. There's only a 1% chance that Biden could have actually made up that much ground and succeeded in going over by, um, Trump's votes. No, he didn't take it. Well, they, uh, maybe, but they didn't take into account that there's, uh, you know, this pandemic is going on. And that, so they're also claiming that all these other four states, they, they didn't go uh, through the process of allowing mail-in voting the correct way, which is not true because they did. The legislature signed off in all of those. Well, well, let me add this thought. Um, and that is, uh, you know, we, we can't tell from the question whether the person is asking about fraud by the Republicans or fraud by the Democrats. But let me add, I don't think we give enough attention to what the Republicans have done in terms of suppressing votes on a racial basis, in terms of uh, undoing the post office, which is not yet fully restored, even at Christmas, um, in terms of the gerrymandering. I mean, I could go on and on in the intimidation. Um, you, you know, is that not uh, fraud? Is that not a violation of our voting system and our constitution? Everybody talks about, you know, the Republicans talk about, you know, so what do they call it? It's projection, right? in psychology is projecting. You project your own violations onto the other guy and you, and you focus the attention on him. In fact, the big fraud here, and it's already demonstrated, is the Republican fraud Thank on you. our constitution, on our electorate. And I don't think we can ever forget that. Okay, we're out of time, Tim, but I wanna to go to you for one last thing. You know, Winston mentioned that this the frontline workers that we really care about, the health workers, and in fact, Tonight at five o'clock, you know, we're having our uh, annual uh, holiday party and awards ceremony. Um, and one of the awards is going to uh, Scott Gallagher, who is the director of the MIC unit um, at Queens uh, Medical Center. And those guys in Hawaii are, are the go-to guys for COVID. Uh, they have three floors of that hospital dedicated to COVID cases. And he's the guy that directs it. And it's very touching to hear his remarks and and how he, how he feels about it. So we gave him a community service award and the MICU and all the people in it. And I, I, I really think that was a, a very good award. The other award that I wanna mention is the award that's going to you, Tim. Um, so I wanted, uh, <laughs> I wanted Thanks, you- Thanks, Jay. That. You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> that's, I, I intended to do that for the whole show. And now we're here. How about a round of applause for Tim? Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm well, honored and I appreciate it. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Your comments then about it? Um, I think I did a, a, a little two minute commentary um, for the show tonight. So um, I'll leave it at that. I'll let my words speak uh, later on tonight. Okay, and I'll give you a, a short uh, pre on that uh, is that uh, Tim, Tim is a man of courage. He recognizes the risks and he Yes. He expresses the courage and uh well Jay, now now you're forcing me out of my corner here um these shows don't exist unless we all of us as guests have courage and it's not easy for us and it's not easy to take that position and god bless everyone on this show and um and god bless all the hosts that stand up and and and, and speak truth to power and that's what it takes from community to community from city to city from state to state to stand up and, and as I say tonight, question authority, always, no matter what side it's on, question authority. All right, man. God bless you. God bless us all in these difficult times. Tim Apicella, Winston Welch, Stephanie Dalton, Cynthia Sinclair, you guys are the best. Thank you so much. <laughs> See you next time. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. <laughs>